want to bring this uh, call this meeting for the West Southwest Milwaukee School Board to order. Uh, Ms. Carr, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, Simon, will you please call the roll? I sure will. Mrs. Carr, here. Ms. Steele, here. Mrs. Kaiser, here. Mr. Burns, present. Mr. Ustruck is excused. Mrs. Justum. Okay, I don't believe she is, but let me know if she joins, please, Brandon. Mr. Sikich. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Mr. Keller is excused and President Lee. Here, a proper notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the open meeting laws of the state of Wisconsin. Are there any modifications to the agenda this evening? We have no changes. Okay, then we'll uh, move right into the superintendent's report. Great, um, thank you and good evening, everybody. And for the first time in a long time, um, we have some high school students that are with us um, today from James E. Dotkey Project-Based Learning High School. Um, and we're super excited to have the student voice back in the boardroom, you know, after all the time away. So we're gonna turn it right over to the two of you. Okay. Uh... Hello, my name is Robin Carnico, and I am a junior at Docky PBL High School. Hey guys, my name is Jalen Hughes. I'm also a junior at Docky PBL High School. Thank you so much for having us here tonight and letting us share the exciting things going on at Docky. We'll be back here on May 23rd to share out again. So tonight we plan to focus on the cool things that have gone on in the first half of the school year at Docky. We hope you enjoy our share out. As Docky continues to reinvent itself as the district's only fully functioning project-based learning high school, our goal is to build up the ninth through 12th grade classes to have between 50 and 60 students each. When we accomplish this, we will be serving just under 250 students each year. This year has started off great as we were, oh my goodness, sorry. I left my glasses at home. <laughs> As we were able to build our numbers of underclassmen by adding about 40 new ninth graders and 35 sophomores. Most of these students are at Docky full time, but some are dual enrolled at Hale or Central for a music class, a foreign language class, uh, AP class, or different electives. We want to take more current eighth and ninth graders for next year so we can uh, get to that goal of 50 to 60 students in each grade. For next year, we already have around 35 new ninth graders that have committed to attending to Docky, and we hope to continue to add to that number in the spring and summer in order to get over 50 freshman students. During the second week of school, the entire school was surprised with a trip to Pfizer Forum, the home of the world champion Milwaukee Bucks. We did not know before we rolled up to the arena that we were about to launch an all school and all community partnership with the Bucks. Once we got inside, Mr. Gales introduced a project that we were going to work on and the Bucks representative jumped in to explain further. Our school was challenged with the real world task of creating proposals for Giving Tuesday, which is a global volunteering event that happens every year on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. We stayed at the Pfizer where we broke into groups and began the brainstorming process for our proposals. We had three groups consisting of about 40 students and four staff in each group. Over the next four weeks of school, we spent time in our groups every day planning just how um, businesses have smaller focus groups of employees working on different tasks. Our groups broke into smaller departments. We had departments for research, community outreach, marketing, slash promotion, um, presentation, planning, ETC. On October 1st, members of the Bucks and district leaders came to Docky's auditorium where we pitched our ideas for Global Tuesday in a Shark Tank format. One group had the idea to use the Deer District to host a music and food festival. Another group's plan was all about coordinating a huge community service and fundraising day. And the last group proposed a festival of fun activities to raise funds to create backpacks filled with essential items for people in need. 
in the end, we, we felt pretty proud of the work that we all had com um, collaborated to complete. The Bucks never got back to us with direct feedback on whose proposal they liked the best, but it was never really about that. So we felt pretty good about the experience as a whole. On September 27th, we hosted an open house. It was designed mostly for our current students, but prospective students and families attended as well. It was a great night of showing off our creative spaces and innovative, innovative, <laughs> you know the word, <laughs> approach to teaching and learning. The night was a huge success. Docky is proud to announce for the first time that we have, we have an active PTSA. A few parents got together and wanted to start up the organization and support the powerful work going on at school. And we've had a few meetings this year. PTSA volunteers helped out at our Thanksgiving meal and plan to assist at our senior dinner, teacher appreciation week, graduation, and our June 2nd exp expedition event. In November, Docky hosted visitors from Scope High School from St. Louis, Missouri. The school had representatives that visited us before the pandemic and planned to return uh, later for a deeper dive into the PBL structures at Dockey. Five people, four teachers, and the principal spent an entire day immersed in the innovative work that we are trying to do. They received a tour, they discussed instructional and assessment practices, had time to plan for their school, and spoke with staff and students. The highlight was definitely when they got to speak directly to students to hear about the cool projects that they were working on. In addition to the visitors from St. Louis, Docky has had many other guests this year. We work with, C we work with CISA One and the Institute for Personalized, Personalized Learning that holds conferences every couple of months. Part of those conferences include time for those attending to do school site visits, Docky had more people visit from Missouri, along with folks from Kentucky, Illinois, Tennessee, and other states. We also hosted visits from teachers from our um, district during professional development days and St. Joan Antietam High School in Milwaukee. Um, you just heard how St. Joan Antietam High School came to visit Docky this year. They contacted us to visit after seeing our, our school in a story on the news. Channel 4 came and did a story on our unique lunch period that we call Flex 40. At Docky, you don't have to eat lunch in the cafeteria as a whole school. You're allowed to get your lunch in the cafeteria and then go basically anywhere in the building to relax and enjoy time with friends. Staff are located all over the building in places like the gym, our maker space, our music studio, the bike shop, a bunch of teachers open their classrooms so students can ask for personalized help and advice. And in my experience, most students just sit in the hallways and eat lunch with their friends. Flex 40 is a great time and place to kind of unwind, take a break and get ready for your afternoon classes. At Docky, in order, in order to be strong, critical thinkers and problem solvers, we challenge ourselves with things like design challenges and other crew competitions to learn things and have fun. One crew challenge we had was an egg drop challenge. Crews which are like home, our home rooms, were given the week to research, design, and build containers following certain criteria that we predicted would keep our egg intact. On Friday of that week, we all gathered in the gym to test out our builds. Well, eight of the 12 eggs survived the 25 foot drop from the ceiling in the gym. So Mr. Gales may or may not have moved up to the roof of the school during lunchtime and dropped them off from there. <laughs> in the end, Mr. Lynch's crew, who designed a parachute to protect their egg, won the challenge. This is my final item to report out on this evening. We held our first official all-school exhibition event on the evening of January 20th. It was a way for all of us students to go public on a project or student-run business that we completed and were proud of. Students were spread throughout the building, and they stood with their projects and discussed them with visitors. They shared out projects they made like websites, podcasts, short films, video games, historical timelines, propaganda posters, TikTok channels, beehive products, t-shirts, educational board games, earrings, stop motion videos, and so much more. Our next public exhibition night of our work will be on June 2nd at the end of the year, at the end of the school year. All are welcome. So we hope to see everyone there. Thank you, Robin. And this is my last, this is my last item to share out on. I saved this one for last because it's, it is probably my favorite one to share. Docky received a grant from the Milwaukee Repertory, Repertory Theater called the Reading Residency Grant. The grant gave us the opportunity to, 
I'm sorry, yo. The opportunity. <laughs> the opportunity to have um, a guest artist from the rep come to school three days per week for the third quarter and work with us in Mrs. H.B. Shakespeare with a twist class. In the class, students learned about reading the play, role playing, literacy skills, and Shakespeare as a poet and a writer. Then the coolest part was that on March 15th, we got to go to the rep and attend an, an immersion experience. It was called As You Like It. Before the show, we spent time with set workers, light and sound people, costume designers, and actors. We then stayed and experienced the show, and it was just so powerful. On behalf of Robin and I, along with Mr. Gells and the staff at Docky Project Based Learning High School, I would like to thank you for having us at your board meeting tonight, and we look forward to seeing you again at the May 23rd meeting. Thank you, and have a great night. Oh, um, so we'll move on to 6.2, which is going to be our, hopefully, our last return to in-person learning um, update and presentation. Um, in the last few, we focused a little bit more on the learning part of it rather than the data necessarily. So Deidre will um, pull that up and again, um, emphasize just kind of how we're getting back on track with achievement. Um, but uh, what we... Um, get that computer up. Um, it's, you know, it's the same basic agenda, a little hit on the metrics, our same guiding principles. Um, the metrics um, locally have gone up slightly, um, but that's, you know, a trend that's starting to um, show up across the state nationally and other parts of the world, um, but not to a point at which um, we have any concerns of the thresholds we've set. Um, so we're still in good shape. We're going to continue to monitor it. Um, I did let, um, Bob at the health department know that, you know, we're not going to be um, doing these regular updates anymore um, unless, you know, there's a surge and he gets back to us and says, okay, it's time for you guys to um, visit your plan uh, and to see if, you know, there's going to be a need for masks again at some point in the future. We certainly hope not. Um, things have been going well without them for us uh, and we want to see that continue. So, um, right. So, so like I said, they went up a, a little bit um, in terms of the percent positive, but we're still, you know, the, the green, you know, changes at the 3%. So when we get the 3.4%, um, but we're, you know, we're watching this now just after spring break to see if that's a trend or does, does this go back down again? Um, and that's our internal numbers, which still look really good. Um, and so essentially it's, you know, we're running one or two people that are um, testing positive, one person as at least last week in quarantine. So the academic plan. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, so we wanted to, again, repeat the information about summer school. It's all out on our website now, and there's a bunch of information out there, but we have some pretty amazing opportunities for our students to do some exploration this summer. And so we'll have courses offered, um, a 4K jump start. So those are students that are um, leaving the 4K and entering the 5K, 5K jump start, students leaving 5K and entering first grade. Um, we know that for some of our students, being in person for the first time ever this year was a transition. So we're providing a jump start in the summer to help ease some of that transition into the next grade level. Um, we are doing ninja sports, readers theater, book club cafe, be a math magician, arts and crafts, ooey gooey science, and STEM and design. So we have three locations. Um, families will use Skyward to shine to sign up. There's an instructional video right on our website that gives you a screenshot that shows you exactly how to sign up for courses as they need them. And then in intermediate school, we're doing page to stage, room redesign, summer sports, murals for the community, esports, intro to film, um, better up, which is baking exploration, um, community partnerships, and then a lunch and learn so that there's an opportunity to reinforce some skills around literacy and math. For intermediate school, students will go to their neighborhood intermediate school. So if they're a Franklin Wright student, they'll go to Franklin Wright. Um, and the one thing that we have shifted um, is fifth graders can actually choose where they would like to attend. So they are welcome to attend the elementary sessions at their local, the neighborhood elementary school, wherever that's associated in the pods, or they're welcome to use the summer as a transition to start trying out intermediate school by attending something that's at the intermediate school. Um, and parents sign up for that one with their students on Skyward as well. And then at the high school, the courses will do some credit recovery. We'll continue running our GED Option 2 program. Um, and then for credit attainment, the courses that are approved are health, 
physical education, personal finance, and then strength and fitness, which we offered for the first time last summer that we're going to offer again. And those will be held at the neighborhood high school as well. So if families are looking for more information, you can go right onto our website and our communications team has been super helpful, Tess and Amanda. There's a button now that says summer school. If you click on it, it will show you exactly what courses are being offered. And then at the very bottom is a video. It tells you which weeks we're having summer school. It tells you all the information around times and which session is happening when. And then at the bottom, there is a video that you can watch that actually shows you screenshot by screenshot how to sign up using Skyward. Yes. There was a question online. I just want to make sure it's um, answered out loud. Um, some families were asking if it's just a couple days a week or is it you pay for the whole session or you attend the whole session? Oh, yep. So the sessions are designed or it's free for everyone. Just yes. make sure Sorry that's that. really clear. <laughs> um, free for all students. Um, the sessions are designed. They're four weeks long, right? And it's Monday through Thursday. Of course, if families have a day or two, they're in and out for some things, we will work around that and work with families as best we can but they're project-based design this summer. And so they really will be starting something and then finishing it during that four week cycle. So it's best if students are able to be there for the whole time, but we will work with families no matter what their circumstances are. Once we see who's enrolled and all of those kinds of things, if a family has a question about that, they should just reach out to their current elementary school and make note of that with um, their deeper learning coach or their principal. And then we can work that into the plans for summer. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, and just like I said, beginning of this one, um, we'll continue to monitor the data, but this will be the last regular um, report unless, you know, there's a, a new surge and continue to focus on student achievement um, leaning into summer school. So with that, I'll go on to 6.3, the legislative update. Um, so I won't read all of this. There's a lot here, but it's also available online. Um, the preliminary April 5th school referenda results, um, there were 65 of 81 questions approved in the state. Um, so that's a pretty good success rate. You know, ours um, was not successful. And we're going to um, work through kind of the next steps of our facility master plan um, related to that. But 65 of 81 were approved. Um, Governor Evers announces some school-based mental health funding. So we're definitely going to um, keep track of this. So $15 million in what he has now called Get Kids Ahead initiative. He announced that in his State of the State address. Um, and it's really to support mental health navigators, provide mental health first aid and trauma-based care training or provide family assistance programs. And we um, provide in-school access to mental health therapists now. Um, and so we'll see how this kind of layers in and what it adds for us on and for our students and families. Um, then the governor also took action on a number of related bills. Um, so Wisconsin Act now 212, the law requires um, Department of Public Instruction to exclude data around students that have been in a juvenile detention facility. So there's some parameters there. And up until now, um, those students were counted in the school district where um, the facility um, uh, lives or resides. But um, so it was it was an odd kind of counting in terms of the state report cards. Um, Wisconsin Act 213 adds September 11th to the list of special observance days observed by schools. Uh, and it's specific to remember the terror attacks and to honor law enforcement and firefighters who respond to these kind of events. Um, Wisconsin Act 214, this is a new law that updates allowable version of the foundations of reading test. So it's phasing out the two, two, 2012 version um, that we're currently using. Uh, Wisconsin Act 215 allows a recipient of the online early learning pilot program funds of $500,000. Um, so it, it, it is, you know, a program from um, six districts that are given priority participation. Then uh, Wisconsin Act 217, this new law eliminates the current law sunset date for awarding grants under the dual enrollment program. And so that program continues. And then Senate Bill 597 was vetoed, would have allowed private school, um, ch private choice schools to adopt an early admission policy for four-year-old kindergarten, five-year-old kindergarten, first grade. So that one was vetoed. Um, then the U.S. Secretary of Education calls for using ARPA. So those are the federal or American Rescue Plan Act funds um, to address teacher supply. And we are um, using some of our ARPA or ESSER funds uh, in, in terms of providing um, 
bonuses to attract teachers right now, given the, how tight the marketplace is. Then um, the president is set to announce administration's budget proposal for federal fiscal year 2023. So we'll be watching that um, closely. Under the president's plan, the U.S. Department of Education would receive 88.3 billion in discretionary funding, which is 12.9, or a 17% increase over the 2022 net enacted level. So there's some things now at the federal level um, that we'll continue to watch. Then 6.4 is the Board of Education Recognition. So at Irving, Deeper Learning Coach Aaron Dresky has been selected as a 2022 Herb Cole Educational Foundation Teacher Fellow. She was chosen for this award from among many candidates because of her skill as a leader, an agent for positive change, and her superior ability to inspire love of learning. Part of this award includes a $6,000 grant for Irving School. And then the teacher also receives a $6,000 grant. Uh, so it's a pretty big deal. Um, congratulations to Jordan Pollard, as he was nominated by a former theater student who is currently attending UW-Ripon as Distinguished Educator. So Jordan will be honored at the commencement ceremonies. At Dotkey, congratulations to the Dotkey team for presenting at the DL22 conference in San Diego, California on March 29th to the 31st. So as Angela Wardlow, Kaylee Bitters, Amanda Hayes, Phil Fromm, and Greg Yells shared about all of the um, all the school projects um, and with the Milwaukee Bucks, which we heard a little bit about from the students. Um, attendees from all over the country and even the world got to hear about the project launch goals, process, successes, struggles, iterations, and more. And they got to brainstorm and create their own project with their own local community partners. The best part was highlighting our students through video clips that were prepared where students gave real reflections on what the experience was like for them. So way to go, dot key. Um, and there's also for people interested, there's some links in here to pick pictures. At Shared Journeys, um, Jenny Salazinski, Danny Haven, and Lisa Cola all became certified in exploring observations in early childhood. So congratulations to the students at Shared Journeys who created amazing char charcuterie boards. Um, the the creativity, creativity was flowing. So congrats to Ashley Moreno for receiving the 750 West Dallas Women's Club Scholarship and to Roberta Luna for receiving the 10,000 Herb Cole Scholarship. At Pershing, Natalie um, Kotnick, Pershing and Madison's art teacher was joined, was asked to join the Wisconsin Art, Education, art Educators Association Board at the Southeast Regional Vice President um, this year. Natalie also organized the Southeast Regional Youth Art Month exhibit at the Sharon uh, Wilson Center for the Arts in Brookfield to celebrate Youth Art Month. Four Pershing students' artwork were also chosen to be part of the exhibit. So congratulations to Ms. Kotnick, Melissa Ortiz, Ari Betancourt, Noel Huber, and Isabella Flores for the achievement. Um, Gabrielle uh, Chevrez, a senior at Nathan Hale and former Walker student, completed his Eagle Scout project by creating a portable workstation for Walker's Learning Commons. Um, Gabriel collaborated with Principal Lang and Mrs. Hart, the DLC technology um, teacher, to design and build this workstation. The workstation will become part of a makerspace room for students to use to collaboratively, collaboratively work on different projects. And thank you to Gabriel for choosing to work with his former school to fulfill his Eagle Scout service project. Uh, and congratulations again to him as he advances to the Eagle Scout rank. And there's also a picture there. Then from the facility department, we'd like to recognize Chad Larson and Chuck Jersick. Uh, Chad and Chuck learned of a student who needed wheelchair access to a bathroom in one of our schools that was not made to accommodate wheelchairs. They took swift action to create a wheelchair accessible stall and in just a few hours, um, that student then had um, appropriate access to the restroom. So we're really proud of their initiative and being so responsive to what that student needed. Then 6.5, some just quick um, updates information items. So a couple responses to public comments. So on March 28th, we heard from six members of the public related to the referendum question that was um, on the April 5th ballot. So five spoke against the referendum and one spoke in favor. Then on, on March 14th, the previous meeting, um, because I was not here on the 28th, um, one member of the public indicated that he asked a question on four occasions of me and had not received a response regarding the safety of girls in school restrooms. And I did respond. There was a um, an email that I wrote um, to him much earlier, and he even responded to my email. But, but I, I think it bears um, repeating this, that we work to make sure all students are safe in our schools all the time, right? So we want all students to have access to safe restrooms. We use age-appropriate supervision of restrooms, so smaller kids are supervised differently than high school students, obviously. Um, but we also teach students about safety and about telling a trusted adult if they don't feel safe. Uh, and we also, for any student, 
any student that wants um, a private restroom, uh, we provide access, right? So it has nothing to do with the gender or transgender um, nature of a student. It's simply, are you comfortable and you need access to a private restroom? So we provide those things as well. And, and um, treating females differently in terms of protocols and procedures to access a restroom could be considered discriminatory that we wouldn't have different things just because a, a student is a female. So the, the real work is keeping all students and staff safe and making sure um, students have adults they can turn to if they don't feel safe. Um, and then last, I just I wanna thank everyone again for all of the work on the high school referendum. And I know um, it was a really heavy lift and even though it did not pass, um, our communities are much better educated now about the school facility needs and those things aren't going away. Um, so we're gonna, continue to work on plans. Um, we're going to, we'll continue to explore options for the consolidation of other schools. Uh, that planning team has been working on that has nothing to do with the results of the referendum. That team has uh, been ongoing. And that team is um, now going to bring a workshop to the entire school board on April 25th. So it'll be the first opportunity for everybody to really kind of get their heads around what starts to make the most sense in terms of figuring out um, consolidating schools to save some money because we're going to have to invest in some of the infrastructure needs in the other schools. So just a little bit of foreshadowing and um, that'll be, a, I think, a long conversation on April 25th, but an important one. And that concludes the superintendent's report. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to item seven, which is public comments. Um, as always, you will have three minutes to address the board if you've signed up on our online sheet. Uh, please start your comments with your name and address. Um, the board will uh, not engage in any dialogue with you in regards to your comments and not answer questions in general, unless there is a simple response to a question or comment that can be made immediately after the person is done speaking. Um, but the person still will only have three minutes and will not have any further opportunity to respond to any comments that are made beyond the comment time. Uh, so I will be um, uh, calling the comments in the order that they were signed up on the sheet. And the first one uh, is Ms. Jennifer Ograski which I believe is online. Hello, um, my name is Jennifer Ograski. I live at 9619 West Manitoba Street. And that is of course in West Dallas, 53227. And um, first off, I wanted to say good evening. Um, I am a parent of two boys that currently attend Mitchell and FLW. I am also a district employee and active community member. I am here to promote the Junior Huskies and Junior Bulldogs tackle football programs. This past fall, our Junior Huskies football program was unable to field a full football team of 13 for each grade level. In fact, out of the entire Hale attendance area, we only had five fifth graders. The program actually had to combine grade levels to make a full team. When I attended high school, the football team evoked a sense of pride and school spirit amongst the community. And I wish the same for my boys. The junior programs are a great, great way to develop the school spirit, starting with our younger students in elementary and middle school. Plus they will be better athletes when they get to high school, which leads to more wins. Right now, our junior football programs are in a time crunch to recruit players as both teams need to commit to the league with the number of teams by April 15th. If we overcommit, our programs can be assessed a fine. We have been using social media and in-person recruiting at middle school open house nights along with flyers and would like to thank the board members who shared our Facebook posts. I am here to ask our district leaders to take it one step further and send an email to district families of current fourth through seventh graders with information from both the junior Huskies and junior Bulldog programs. Together, we can make our sports programs in West Dallas, West Milwaukee great. If families with a path to hail are interested in more information about the junior Huskies program, they can email Jeff at jsmitty1242 at gmail.com. If families with a path to Central are interested in the Junior Bulldogs program, they can contact Todd at West Dallas Junior Bulldogs at gmail.com. Families can also reach out to both programs on Facebook. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We can certainly do that. Write us an email to all the families. That's easy. Okay. No. All right, well, we'll work on doing that then. 
Like a, well, so we have a new timer here. So um, I believe our other two uh, people who have signed up are in person. So next we have Mr. John Malling. Hi, my name is John Mulling, 3850 South Pole Drive. Um, people, 59%. Referendum, 41%. 5,965 no's, 4,176 yeses. That's an 18 percentage point difference. It was a shellacking. The results of the referendum were a complete repudiation of the project. Only one ward in the school district had more yes votes than no, so it was everywhere they said no. As Bob Dor in the Milwaukee Journal stated, quote, voters have loudly said no. He also said, quote, a $149.8 million referendum was defeated soundly, end of quote. Bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, if I can still use those terms, the voters don't want any new construction period, exclamation point. But you know what, Noah, the day after, you also had to talk to the journal and I don't know that you got the message. In the journal, you were quoted, quote, so the feedback we've gotten is that this is not something that the community wants to move forward with right now, comma, at least in its current form. Noah, with the declining school district, the people don't want any new construction of any form. The community would like you to one, remodel, upgrade, and refurbish within our money means. They don't want new construction and new foundations built. Don't come back in a couple weeks, couple months with another $125 million referendum because it's gonna be defeated again. We don't want new construction. Please learn your lesson. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Mr. Joe Mikolajczyk. Joe Mikolajczyk, 3355 South Russell Court in Berlin. The voters let you know what they thought about your ideas and the referendum last Tuesday. It was a resounding no, 59% no which is in the world of politics is a landslide. One day after the spectacular defeat and rejection of your ideas, Noah Lee indicated you will be coming back with another referendum, bad idea. Then he stated, I will seek more input. I think I know where a majority of your input will come from. It will come from the consultants you hire to see what the maximum number for a referendum they think <clears throat> you can get away with. Dishonest school boards and all of you sitting there along with the superintendent and administration do exactly that. Well, I have some input for you. That's an awful lot that an awful lot of taxpayers and parents agree with. One, sell all unnecessary school buildings and consolidate. If you do that, there won't be any need for a referendum. The problem is, you have absolutely no interest in doing that. I know this because you never seriously considered this. That is disgusting and shows how fiscally irresponsible your actions are. You certainly are good at crying about how old the buildings are and they need some taxpayer money in the Taj Mahal additions. I'm also certain those ideas came from the consultants. Here's another idea to save millions of dollars annually. Get rid of the expensive teachers union WEA trust. As hundreds of school districts in the state have done, I know you have not seriously considered this because I've asked numerous times about an analysis and you have never provided even a cursory analysis. The teachers union certainly does not want you to dump the WEA trust. You serve the teachers union and school administration, not the taxpayers and students. How much did this referendum cost the taxpayers? Consultants for surveys that attempt to determine the maximum amount of a referendum, fees paid to the architects and C.G. Schmidt, 
cost of numerous multicolored flyers sent to all district residents to push the referendum along with signs that match the flyers. You need to start listening to parents and taxpayers. You obvi they obviously do not want anything to do with a referendum. I believe they want good education for their children in a failing school system that is absolutely irresponsible with taxpayers' money. I certainly hope you took notice of what happened to school boards that do not serve the voters. They're elected to serve. Your day of reckoning is coming. Mark my words, it is coming. Thank you. So there's a lot to unpack there, a lot of information that's incorrect. But I will just say regarding my comments, I never stated that there would be another referendum, but I did say that there might be another referendum. So I just wanna make sure that's clear. All right, there's no one else signed up for public comments at this time. If there was anyone else who was watching via Zoom who was interested in signing up, I'll wait 30 seconds here just to allow you that time. Uh, there should be a link in the chat for the Zoom uh, call here this evening if you're interested in addressing the board. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item eight, close public comments. So our board reports. So we have item 8.1, which is a review of the board calendar. So today is Monday, April 11th, and our meeting started at 5.30 uh, this evening. And we have a regular board of education meeting. We do have a workshop that's gonna be um, before our action item this evening, which is talking about the proposed 22-23 budget implementing tax levy number one. Then Monday, April 18th at 6 p.m., we have a health insurance marketing discussion workshop, uh, which might be of interest to some people. And then on Monday, April 25th at 6 p.m., we have a regular Board of Education meeting where we have our newly elected board members taking their oaths of office. And then we have a workshop on the school consolidation, which is also going to be a very important workshop uh, for all us here on the board, as well as many in our community. Then on Monday, uh, May 9th at 6 p.m., we have a regular Board of Education meeting and then a guaranteed and viable curriculum workshop immediately following. So let's move on to item 8.2, our committee reports. 8.2.1, life readiness through career and college of career preparation. Ms. Ustruck isn't here. Is there another person? Okay, Ms. Steele. And it's gonna be um, quick and, and, and short because I didn't realize I was gonna have to do this. So um, we did meet this evening. It was kind of a quick meeting. Um, so we have the canvassers here and there's a bunch of other stuff going on. But basically what we talked about is there um, on our at, on April 25th, um, our librarians will be coming to us to review um, the library plan. So DPI requires that um, our libraries, our librarians create a new library plan every three to five years. Um, the plan is based on DPI's Wisconsin Digital Learning Plan and the Future Ready Framework. So um, basically it's just, we kind of went through in committee all the different goals. So they'll actually be coming uh, to, to the, um, to the board on 425 to go over that and our different goals. So that's basically what we talked about. All right. Does uh, anybody have any questions or uh, any topics that they would like the committee to consider at their next meeting? And Jeff, if you do, please uh, raise your hand so I can see you. Yes, please. You do have a you do have a one to add, Jeff? Raise your hand. And I was well, she's right side up this time. <laughs> All right, Th thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to eight point two point two communications community relations. Ms. Kaiser, uh, thank you. At the March twenty eighth communications and community relations meeting, we discussed some of the referendum communication opportunities that were lead that led up to the April fifth vote. We want to thank everyone on the board who took time out of their lives to meet with community members. A very big thank you to everyone in the community who reached out to us with questions, concerns, and ideas concerning the referendum. Um, we also began talking about teacher appreciation week coming up soon, and I will divide, divulge no more because a lot of teachers in the room. That's <laughs> All it. right. Very good. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any comments or questions that they would have for the uh, committee? Something they want to consider at their next meeting? No? No? Seeing none. All right. We'll move on to 
uh, and 8.3 board member reports of community events. Is there any community events that board members like to call out for? Sure. So first I want to say, I want to give a huge shout out again to our music department. They had the choir festival on March 31st and it was, it was great. Anytime our music department puts on a, a festival, it's, it's awesome. So I just, it was, I, you know, I always get very emotional and it was, it was, it was just, it was really great. The kids did wonderful. So, you know, I'm just very proud of our music department. So I wanted to mention that. And then I just wanted to say thank you to FLW. They had a showcase um, for National History Day and Shark Tank projects. Um, they just invited us. And so I, you were there, no, I think it was April 1st. And um, the kids did a great job. In fact, I just want to give a shout out to one of the kiddos. Her name is Lilia. She had her, um, her paper there and I said hey can I take one and she's like I don't think you can take a copy and I'm like hey that's cool I understand she wrote about the uh, trail of tears and she actually reached out to me and she said I talked to my teacher she emailed me and said she said I could give you my paper and so she sent it to me so I thought that was really awesome I read the whole paper it was really great so um I love those opportunities and it's just great to see the kids learning they had I mean they had everything I mean kids covered all different types of topics they created their own um some of their own inventions um or things so uh I just love seeing that kind of stuff. So I just want to say, hey, if there's any teachers or students out there, if you guys have events going on, please, you know, reach out to the school board and invite us. We love coming to your schools. We love to be able to see this type of stuff. So yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else have anything? Ms. Kaiser? I have to say also the all district choral festival. I was that person in the front row weeping because it's just so nice to be with seeing these concerts again and like the littles were so cute and like seeing the high school and just my middle schooler was singing and it was just wonderful it was really nice to see so many um family members in the audience singing along when they was encouraged to sing along so it was wonderful and i have to just say thank you so much to all our choral directors in our district who just put together a, a very complicated um concert and did it in a beautiful way yes very good Anyone else, Jeff? Did you have anything? Nothing for Jeff. Well, I'll just echo the sentiments from Ms. Steele and Ms. Uh, Ms. Kaiser. I was uh, also at the Coral uh, Festival. Um, I was very impressed with uh, all the work that was done and super impressed with the staff, with the elementary students and giving them buckets to drum on um, because I thought that number one, that song was very impressive, but it's, it must have been a lot of work to make sure they weren't just banging them randomly. So I give them a lot of credit for that. Um, but overall, again, very well done. And, and call a shout out to Mary Pat, who organizes all that, uh, all the festivals that we do. So that was uh, that was great. And then FLW was very powerful. Um, one of the presentations was done by a couple of students. They did it on Agent Orange. And there was actually a Vietnam veteran who was there as part of another project, he came up and talked to them about Agent Orange because he'd actually been affected by it mm -hmm. and had, had uh, unfortunately, other members had come back from Vietnam who had passed away from complications of being exposed to Agent Orange. So I thought it was a really uh, powerful demonstration of showing that here, here's something they did research on independently. They didn't know that this person was going to be there and then had real world experience to talk to someone who was affected by it. So I thought it was um, really great. And, these public demonstrations of learning, I think are fantastic and really something that every time I go to them, I'm very impressed by the depth of knowledge that these students are able to uh, show for the, for the topic that they picked. And it's something that they're interested in. So they really are, are more passionate about the things that they're doing and talking about. So I just want to say, say that. So anything else before I close the reports here on community events? All right, let's move on to our item nine, our consent agenda. So we have item 9.1, which is the approval of our minutes from our March 28th uh, regular board meeting. We have item 9.2, the employment summary, and item 9.3, our supplementary contracts. Does anyone need anything separated? For a motion. Move to approve. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Any last minute discussion? All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that passes. All right, so let's move right into our workshop this evening. Um, 10.1, Financial Stability and Efficiency Proposed 22-23 Budget Implementing Tax Levy. Ms. Windler. Good evening, everybody. So we moved this workshop up two weeks. This was supposed to be at the end of April, and we thought it was important and prudent to get this 
to our board and community first, and then we can talk about CPI tonight um, because our contracts are set to go this Thursday. So um, that's why we're meeting on our budget workshop a few weeks early tonight. So we, we'll start tonight with the foundation of our budget, and that is the state budget factors that we get um, every two years. So the 22-23 budget is the second year in the state's biennial budget. So they work on a two-year budget cycle. We're moving into the second year of the budget cycle. It's always easier to have the known factors moving into the budget because otherwise at this point next year, we still are dealing with assumptions and unknowns, um, which can be a big swing within the budget. Although having said that, those factors um, that we're looking at the per pupil increase in the revenue limit is zero dollars and that's for both 21 22 and 22 23. and i just want to spend a minute putting this into context because it's important for our cpi conversation tonight too and just our budget as a whole so when revenue limits were in, enforced in 93 94 the per pupil increases were historically tied to CPI. So that increase in the per pupil amount increased by CPI, which you see the red and the blue line are the same until 08, 09 when the recession hit. And that's when those two items were no longer tied to each other. The state took the per pupil increase and separated it from CPI, not, per, not with a statute or anything, but they just no longer gave schools an increase in the per pupil amount that equated to CPI. So that was the first dip. And then you see the large dip, which was in 2011, that is Act 10. And there were different factors that came into play there where school districts were able to help balance their budget um, via no longer having to pay the full portion of WRS. Now, employees took a portion of that on, et cetera. We won't go into all those details, but that's what that big dip is there. And then you see those two lines continue to not meet. And you see the last two years of, the, of that those two lines not meeting and in fact staying at a zero dollar increase in the per pupil amount so as that happens those two lines get farther from each other which means it becomes harder and harder to balance our budget um, at the same time we're seeing a record high cpi number so we haven't seen a number this high since the 80s so what i want to show you in this chart is the number on the left is the per pupil increase that we saw in, so we call it new revenue. So it's either per pupil increase within the revenue limit, or there's now per pupil categorical aid outside the revenue limit. The total of the increases that we saw in either of those are in this chart here. So we can see the increases over time, $100, 150, zero, 100, 200, et cetera. But notice the numbers on the left, the CPI numbers over time. So going back to 1314, we had 2.07, 1.46, 1.62. We had a 0 0.12 one year. Um, and as you go up the chart, we had a 2.44. And in that year, we said, whoa, 2.44. And now we're looking at a 4.7% CPI increase. So again, it's a high number that we haven't seen since the 80s. Um, at the same time, we're seeing two years of no new revenue, which ultimately results for us in a de decrease, decreasing revenue um, while we're trying to meet the CPI. And this is context. And our, you know, as we move forward tonight, we're going to um, recommend that we do move forward with the 4.7% CPI increase across employee groups. And I'll explain um, some of the reasons behind that and why we're able to recommend that tonight. So. Noteworthy, I have this in every year. This budget is jello at this point. There's a lot of factors that are in flux. We do know our revenue factors from the state, which um, are very helpful in planning, but there's still lots of factors that um, could change moving forward between now and October when the full budget is actually approved. So we'll spend the majority of our time going through this slide. Um, there's a lot of words. We'll go through it kind of bullet point by bullet point because this is what makes up our budget. So. You'll see the first item here is just that $0 increase in the per pupil funding that we talked about. So no new revenue for us is basically what that means. And at the same time, we have built into our budget, which is not balanced, and I'll talk through that in a second, um, the 4.7% CPI increase for all employee groups. And again, the reason why we're bringing this workshop forward is because the next item on our agenda is uh, the recommended per pupil, sorry, recommended CPI increase um, because contracts go out this Thursday for our professional educators. Um, the reason that we are able to move forward and recommend that 4.7% CPI increase for all employee groups is because our diligence in aligning staffing with enrollment. So um, that is something that we practice and we 
it helps balance our budget each year. What we're looking at in terms of the CPI, a full 4.7 across all employee groups is about a $2.26 million increase in cost. So 2.26 million increase in cost. And that reduction in staff that we talked through on the February 28th meeting, that ultimately results in a savings of 1.8 million. So those two numbers aren't the same, but they're they're close that close enough that allow us to help balance our budget with this 4.7% CPI increase. So although we have zero dollars in new revenue, that alignment of our staffing with our enrollment each year is what's helping us right now in the in this year going forward, even with that high CPI. Uh, move forward with that recommendation that we uh, adopt the CPI at the full amount for all employee groups. So that's just an important piece to note. That's why we align. That's that's us being fiscally responsible with our dollars so we can compensate our, our staff um, as we would hope to. Um, the other pieces that are included in this budget are the compensation model components. So again, there's the $200 annual increase and up to $300 in micro-credentials annually. And again, those are compounding. So uh, micro-credentials, for example, of what that compounding nature means is if a teacher, let's say this year earns $300 in micro-credentials and never again completes any micro-credentials, they'll receive $300 every year for all the years that they are in the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District. Um, annually for teachers, that $200 compounding number means that this year they get $200. Next year, if you're here again, you get $400. The next year you get $600. Um, and so there's those documents within our compensation model report that link to a bunch of different charts. If, for all our different types of learners, whether you wanna see that in a chart or a visual graph or whatever it is, um, that compounding nature of those comp model components are included in this budget as well. Uh, we also have included in the budget as an assumption, an 8% health insurance increase, which is about $500,000 in cost and a 5% dental insurance increase. We also have minor service or department increases. So that's utilities, that's transportation, that's our contracts with various vendors. Um, so like all costs go up every year in your regular budget, same with our school district. Um, and then also we have our schools, their school budgets are funded at 75%. So that's our own internal building budget allocation formula. For the last few years, they've been at 75%. So this budget also includes them at that 75%. We have $1.5 million in capital improvements built in this budget as a preliminary number. So we're working through what our, um, our roofing plans are. So each year we have the roof portions that are coming due for upgrades. So that's the roofing, that's boilers, that's parking lots, et cetera, those big capital improvement dollars. This number, now that we've had a lot of conversation in our community about capital improvements, this is that same budget that would fund capital improvement needs throughout our district. So we've talked, about the 248 million, this is that number that would have to fund um, capital improvements. And that, that 248 million is that same, same thing we're talking about. So in terms of the high schools, we talk about at the two comprehensives, that's $60 million of capital improvement needs. And we're looking at 1.5 million in our budget. So just to put that into some context, um, if we want to increase that number, which you know we, we could do, Budget's all about priorities. So we can do anything, but we can't do everything. If we want to increase that, say, to $5 million, we're looking at $3.5 million to cut somewhere else. There's not $3.5 million in new money, so we, have to, we would have to reduce that elsewhere. Um, and there will be lots of further board conversations, as Noah referenced, in our board calendar upcoming. Um, we don't have additional use of ESSER to balance this, so that means we're not just plugging in um, ESSER funds off the bat right here to balance this, the shortfall that we'll see in the next slide. And then... Another significant piece of savings that's allowing us to come closer and recommend the full CPI tonight is our retirees 65 and over move to that Medicare Advantage plan. So in our budget right now, we're um, budgeting a savings of $500,000 from that change. So what does this mean ultimately is that um, our revenues are still less than our expenses. So revenues are about all, just shy of $100 million and expenses at um, 101.6 projected at this point, which means we're just shy of $2 million projected deficit, which we will balance before our budget is project, uh, which before our budget is approved. So again, this is just a preliminary budget. It's April, we approve our budget for the final budget in October. Um, and before that, the board will approve a preliminary budget before the end of June. So we're looking at a projected deficit right now of about $1.98 million which we will work to balance in following ways. So we have a few opportunities here. 
The first is a debt reduction plan. So we have Fund 38 debt on our books. That's non-referendum approved debt that has existed for a number of years on our books. And again, Fund 38 is within the revenue limit. So any debt that we have in Fund 38, we have to pay that. And then the rest goes to Fund 10. So if we have less Fund 10, Fund 38 debt, I'm sorry, if we have less Fund 38 debt, we have that frees up dollars within our Fund 10 budget. So um, we're looking at utilizing our ESSER dollars to pay off some of that fund 38 debt early that's on our books if we can. So that's kind of the next step on, on my plate here is that debt reduction plan. We also have the governor's per pupil aid. Um, and if we need to, we can dig into those funds to help balance our budget. But again, those are one-time dollars. So one-time dollars to support operational expenses is not recommended because that creates a cliff. And then finally, we do we would have the option to reduce our fund 46 transfer. And these are just three options. You know, the options are on endless, um, but these are three potential recommended options. But Fund 46 is a capital improvement fund. So we're again talking about the needs of our capital improvements. Budgets are about priorities. If we reduce our Fund 46 transfer, that's less dollars that could go into future capital improvements. So I have uh, some work to do on my end and starting with, these are kind of in priority orders or starting with that debt reduction plan. And then in June, we'll have a workshop um, which we'll have more information on these items at that point. And then following the workshop in a separate meeting before the end of June, we'll have a approval of our preliminary budget. And then finally, before we wrap up is just a projection of the mill rate. So we've talked about this, we've seen this graph a lot and now there's another bar that's even lower than the previous one. Um, so we're looking at a projected mill rate of in 22, 23 of $6.81. And over the next five years, we're looking at continued decreases in the mill rate. So that's due to a number of factors. The first is that we've paid off our fund 39 debt, which is referendum approved debt. So any previous referendum debt we had on our books, which would have increased the mill rate, which we've learned a lot about these last few months, um, that is no longer on our books. So that is part of the reason why those bars are going down. In addition, our overall revenue limit is decreasing. So on the next few factors I'll talk through all play together in the same way but our overall, overall revenue limit is decreasing. In addition, our tax base is increasing. So um, our tax base goes up, which means there's more property value to spread around the tax levy. And then third, which also plays into this, is that we're a greater percent aid funded. So basically our total revenue limit minus our aid equals our levy. So when the aid goes up, our levy goes down. So all those factors are playing together to keep these bars decreasing. So we'll see that likely over the next number of years as well. And that is all I have for our prelim budget. What can I answer for you? I love the high level. <laughs> Questions? Go ahead, Jane. Can you just refresh my memory on um, Fund 46? What? Tell me what's... Yep, so Fund 46 is, our, is a capital improvement fund. That's the fund we talk about, the five-year timer, which goes up in October of this year. So October, 2022, which this is the turf one, right? Yes. What I'm about. This is the turf. the turf one. We previously called it the turf field replacement plan. Um, <laughs> over winter, plan. we expanded the use of fund 46, the, the options that we could spend fund $46 on. So that doesn't mean we have to spend dollars on those. The dollars are could still, and the board obviously will approve that, that spending, it's still spend on the turf field replacement plan. But now we've expanded the, the definition, the plan for the capital improvements, meaning the board could decide to spend those dollars on, if we wanted to say one year fund $3 million instead of 1.5 on capital improvements. I'm making the number, you can name the number. Any money that's in fund 46, we could spend on capital improvements that are now listed in the plan, our roofs, our boilers, our parking lots, et cetera. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, can you talk a little bit about see, since, Jeff. since the referendum was not successful and we had um, essentially earmarked $5 million of ESSER funds, yeah. right? How does that now play into the overall budget? So the ESSER funds that we earmarked are ultimately could still end up in a fund 46 transfer for future purposes. Um, we'd have to work through how that works and what that looks like, but it's still an option for us. Um, and so we talked about overall the referendum was 10 million more than was on the actual, the, I shouldn't say it, the project was 10 million more than was on the actual referendum question. The other 5 million is at fund 49, another capital improvement fund from our building sale. Okay. So that still exists there and could be utilized in any which way for <laughs> capital improvements that 5 million. So the 5 million from master funding that would have been utilized for 
supporting the full high school project um, could still be utilized if our board decides via a fund 46 transfer as well. So we can work through that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, Brandon, uh, Jeff has a question. Could you oh. switch the audio over? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Caitlin, my question is, if this budget, I know budgets evolve, but if this budget stays the way it is, what percent of our budget is state aid? What percent of our budget is state aid? We are funded more heavily in state aid than we are in property taxes. So I can't tell you the exact percentage off the top of my head, but it's a ballpark I want to say in the 53 to 58% range. So Thanks. our overall revenue is about 85% from the revenue limit of that amount. So if you call our budget $100 million, which approximately without grants is 100 million, 85 million of that would come from the overall revenue limit. And I would say about somewhere between 53 and 58% comes from state aid. So 53 to 58 million approximately, I'd say comes from state aid, Jeff. Thank you. So this is done, just we're all aware because we're gonna be asked to approve something which we don't normally do. So normally the purpose, right. we, we wouldn't approve CPI or anything like that this early in the game because we know the Jello budget is where we're at right now. Um, and we will approve a different budget, which we always do in June, which is always at a deficit because we haven't gotten our, you know, our health insurance um, renewal rates and that sort of thing yet. Um, so that's the last one is in October. So if there's any questions, comments, or concerns, okay, Jane. Yeah, I just, so I know, um, Caitlin, you talk to the board a lot about the cliff and about mm -hmm. not spending money that that's not going to be renewing and we're going to have every year. And so you're showing us ways that we can, for this year, give yes. the CPI of mm -hmm. 4.6. And that's wonderful. But what about the following year and, and so on? I'm, I, it worries me a bit mm -hmm. that, um, you know, teachers won't get that. And is, is that clear to everybody? Is Sure. So that's a good question, Jane. So the ways that we're balancing, so those three that we talked about, let me go back to that slide if I can. The debt reduction plan is ultimately, it's not cliff building. It's if we pay off our debt early, that funds our date debt, it's not like we have more on our books. So we pay it off and then it just doesn't come back. Um, the utilizing the other two are basically one-time supports to balance our budget. So ideally we only do number one to balance our budget. If we only did number one though, they're with the factors as they are, we wouldn't be able to afford the full 4.7 CPI. We can afford the four, full 4.7 CPI this year with these other factors. And again, there's everything's just, if health insurance comes back at less than 8%, 8% like dramatically less than 8%, we wouldn't, you know, that would affect our, our deficit. Mm -hmm. Our deficit would be smaller. So there's lots of factors that could change. Um, the other thing you mentioned, okay, so you talked about the 23, 24 potential for mm -hmm. CPI. So this is another interesting one. Um, so we look at our chart of CPIs and we're like, whoa, 4.7, this is crazy. 23, 24, we are looking at projected right now, CPI in between five and 8%. So even more off the charts, like we wow. were talking about 4.7, wow. this is nuts. Five, five, between five and 8%. It would be very, very difficult with two years of no per pupil increases, no revenue limit increases or categorical aid increases to fund a 4.7 on top of a somewhere between five and 8% because CPI is base building. So once we do a CPI, it's part of our budget forever and ever and ever, as long as our staff are with us. So it is likely that we would not be able to support a full a full CPI. Again, too many unknowns for me to say anything definitively. We don't know what state budget, if the state budget comes in at like an $800 per pupil, that could change the game for us. Um, we have no idea what the state budget could come in at. It came at $0 for two years in a row. Um, we do know that the state is sitting on a lot of money on the sidelines. So the state has a major surplus right now. It depends how the state uses those, do those dollars. Um, so too many unknowns to say one way or the other, how 23, 24 CPI would look. Um, I just know that's going to be high and we have no idea what our revenue is. And those two things have, they're all important in developing our budget. So, so that's a non-answer for you, Jane. <laughs> okay. I, 
I have faith in you. <laughs> the other question I had was about um, um, in the board report that I read, uh, we would not be offering this to new teachers, um, signing of new teachers. Right. Can you talk to me. Yep. Like, so it's it's been our practice. Um, we did have one year when it really is sort of an erroneous that it was an error that okay. was um, CPI was for new staff, but CPI has historically been based on our budget for all of our returning educators. Okay. I, I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering why you chose to do that. Any other questions? So this isn't precedent setting. This is something we're doing to try to give staff. Okay. I'm a little sorry. You're all right. You can keep going Another if you question? want. I do. Never so. mind. I'll say it after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we had brought up before was um, that we had with our compensation model, we had uh, some of the people in the middle of our field that were not um, adjusted the way that we had expected that they would be. And so if we're looking at going with the CPI piece, those people that have been stuck in the middle, they're going to, are we going to, we wouldn't have the money then to we keep can't adjusting do them. Yeah. We can't do both. Okay, so those people in the middle would get stuck. If if we move forward with CPI without any further changes to um, the compensation model as is, then yes. Okay. Um, there may be uh, an opportunity next year, you know, if we can't get the 8%, is there a balance on some CPI increase and start to address the that kind of middle group with some other kind of supplemental adjustment? So I think we keep working on trying to resolve that. Mm -hmm. Right now, it really is 4.7 seems to be kind of what's happening in our area more and more. And for us to be able to attract, mm -hmm. retain, that's really the, the effort here is to get this into the contract and um, you know, thank all of our teachers for signing their contracts and you know we're going to have them next year. Mm -hmm. okay. Go ahead, Kristen. Is there any plan to readdress the teacher compensation plan this year or coming up into the next like board cycle year? It, it would be, an, so the board can work with the committee. So that would be um, okay. employee engagement and culture, right? Okay. With that one. Yeah, and I, I can see the, the people who are stuck in the middle, maybe, you know, use of one-time funds to try to get people one-time places might make more sense for that. Since it's a, a one-time increase and then after that, it's just continuing on the normal path. So something can be discussed and looked at as we move forward, but um, understand, and understanding that, this affects everyone. Um, that would only affect a, sub, a subset of the staff. Yeah. And uh, this isn't that, you know, I didn't know other districts were going for 4.7. I know quite a few are not. Um, right. Not There's, able to afford it. Right. We're going to her position then some maybe. Um, yeah, the number right here is a lot is three. I know Wawa mm -hmm. Tosa did 4.7. Milwaukee is definitely trying to get to 4.7. Green Bay did over four. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're not the only ones um, trying to develop a budget that includes it. I have more than you have more questions. Yeah, well, it's more. So if there's others that can't do this, since we keep getting accused of being fiscally irresponsible, is it fiscally irresponsible to go all the way up to the 4.7? So I would say it would be fiscally irres irresponsible, definitely, to go up to 4.7 and not proceed with our regular um aligning staff with enrollment but that is why like our diligence with that is what allows us to do this frankly because the that dollar amount is so similar that's so large our largest bucket of I shouldn't our largest category of funds is salary benefits so, so i wouldn't say I, it's budgets are about priorities so i'd say that's us prioritizing teacher compensation so because we're being responsible with how we're directing yes. our funds, we're responsible doing this as yep. well. Absolutely. Okay. Other questions, Jeff, did you have anything else? Jeff's good, anyone else? All right, well, if not, then we'll close this workshop mm -hmm. and we'll move on to our action item this evening. Marianne's going to join us. Uh, so item uh, 11, 11.1, 22-23 base wage increase for all employee groups. Uh, Good evening. Um, before uh, we start, I did want to thank a few people because um, 
this is unprecedented um, that we're doing it so early. And again, the goal to kind of do this early was to let the staff know that we value them and that we're doing everything in our power to compensate them competitively. Okay. We, we know we have work to do, but this is just another part of it. Mm -hmm. But we did have a lot of people who, who did what I would call major hoop, hoop jumping, and that involves our partners um, with the Teachers Association and our um, Educational Assistance Association and their business manager, as well as Caitlin's staff, um, the members of my staff, and as well as Suzette. They, again, it was major hoop jumping. So what we're asking tonight is to approve a 4.7% uh, wage increase for uh, the teacher union, as well as the um, educational assistance and the entire staff. So this is for all employee groups. For all employee all groups. groups. Administrators. Yes. Our, our uh, facility staff, the secretaries, everybody. Okay. Questions? Jeff, do you have any questions? No question, look for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any last minute discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that passes. Thank you. Yay. Yay. All right, thank you, everyone. That's the last thing I have on the agenda. So I look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much, Aye. everyone.